Come on, everybody, stand up. Give Mark Strauss and the band a great big hand, folks. It's good. Lift your hands toward these requests. Lord, we thank you that there's families in here that have problems that I can't solve. But God, when I pray, I know you can solve them all. And I thank you, Father, that you're going to do a miracle for these wonderful people that are trusting us with their prayer requests. Father, be involved in their lives. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. And Father, for this offering, Give us more than we've ever had before. Bless your kingdom. Bless this church in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Remain standing just for a moment. Now, folks, we're talking a lot about offerings and stuff. Come ahead, Jack. But we're doing a lot of things in our church. That's the only way I can tell you. Very soon, the new chairs will be in on Thursday over here to the south of me. All you over there will sit in new chairs next week amen but we're going to get all of that done very quickly and also we're going to start on the platform it's going to be our number one thing that we're going to begin to address before we finish out in the auditorium i've asked him to start on the platform first right after the chairs and the carpets are here we're going to go to the platform it's going to begin to be redesigned and everything's going to begin to happen you'll be able to see it and know that we're using the money that you give in extra offerings to be able to get a lot of things done in your church. Now, I'm not talking to visitors. I'm talking to my members. Visitors, you don't have to give one nickel to this. If you become a member of my church, you better. Amen? But I'm talking to my members of my church. We're going to get everything remodeled in our church, and it's going to be very, very beautiful. October 190 will be finished. 190 and I expect us to see thousands, hear me when I say this to you, thousands of new people in our congregation. I do believe that. Yeah, I give a good one myself. And they're going to come flooding into our church because they're able to be in our church from Plano in about 10 minutes or 12 minutes, towway and all the way up to 161 and be able to come 635 and 114. They'll be able to be at our church and there's been a, a lack of transportation, ability to get here by highways in the past. But now that's going to be changed. And you're going to begin to see people show up. So I'm asking people to help me as best you can. Now I have a building committee and we need to announce them someday, Frank. Every week I want to do that. Next week I want to do that. Saying it right now, I want to be able to get my guys that are part of the building committee so you can see them. I think we have about six on that committee, don't we, Coral? Eight men that are giving their expertise to make sure we get this. As, um, well, we pay good amount of money spent for all the things we're doing because we're doing great things, but they're able to do it a little bit cheaper because of their expertise. Amen, and I appreciate it so much. But we'll announce them to you and let you see them because they're involved. You know, I don't go into the meeting with them. I don't go into them. Bobby, I don't go into that meeting, do I? I stay out. The Coral's in there a lot. But I go in and I hear them discussing these things. I say, I'm leaving. Because when you get architects with builders and you get them all in the same room, creators, architects, and builders, they kind of disagree at times. You understand? So I just say, I'm leaving. I'm not coming in there because I want to keep peace in my heart. Amen? But they are able to come to good decisions about your church. And I want you to know, I appreciate them a lot. So when you give offering today, just understand we're giving because we're redesigning our church. We're modeling our church. It's been 14 years since we've been doing this. And now we're going to go through this whole church. Believe me, it's going to happen. Those chairs that you sit in... They cost us $70,000, $70,000, and we got another six hundred dollars coming in. It's $70,000, plus I'm going to buy some more in the future, amen? We got people that are out there selling other chairs, doing all sorts of things. I got to announce them too, Frank, because they are working very hard. Right, Coral? 
make sure that they get applauded for, by you. Okay, I want to take this few moments to say this to you. Thank God for our wonderful people of our church. So come and give everybody and be a blessing and get this thing done. Amen. Can I hear an amen? All right. Can you live, live a perfect life? You came to be the living word of life. You came to die, so we be reconciled. You came to rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer our everything that's why we bow down and worship this king cause he gave his everything cause he gave his everything Let's jump up on our feet one more time. Jack, wait a minute. Somebody's bringing some more money down here. Let's jump up. Let's sing that song together. Come on, everybody. Come on, sing it. Let's clap our hands. Let's enjoy this song. Come on. He came to live. He came to live. Live a perfect life. He came to be. and girl to go with Pastor LaVorne to Powerhouse. Let's give her kids a great big applause. Have fun, kids. Thank you, band. Thank you, singers. Hey, man, I want you to look at this. It's going to come up on the screen right now. I found this in the U.S. Today paper. It comes up on the screen. It says, stress can ravage the body Unless the mind says no. Unless the mind says no. Everybody say no to stress. There's things you've got to do. You've got to learn how to keep calm and learn how to reduce stress. Another part of it is this is how stress can cause cell damage, aging. I don't like that aging part. How stress can cause cell damage, aging. And start talking about how it makes us old. I don't want to be old. You want to be old? But you better learn how to deal with stress. It goes on to say, and this is ways to avoid stress. It gives us ways to avoid stress. 
It tells us that we have to make sure we don't let it become toxic to us. Number one, it says, get regular exercise. How many of you are exercising regularly every day? How many are not exercising every day? Well, you're dealing with stress in the wrong way. You need to start walking a little bit. Just walk in the morning, walk at night, do something. Deal with stress a little time. Find the time to pray or meditate. How many pray every day? Well, see, so that's better. So you didn't exercise, but you prayed a little bit more. Amen? And then it med meditate. That means run the word over and over again in your mind. You need to get one of those little things, a little bit of cards. They have little boxes. You can pull one out and have one that you read all the time. You look at it and say, oh, I can overcome all problems in life just because I believe God. That's what you need to have. Amen? Then number three, it says, ask for help when demand, demands pile up. Learn how to delegate it. Get somebody else that know what they're doing and get them to give you input. Amen? Do you do that? Most of you do that. Most of you in this room are married. You got your wives. Amen? Yeah, that's what happens. Well, it's the truth, isn't it? Tim, is that the truth? No! All right, another one is, number four, it says develop a support network of friends and family members. That could be a small group ministry. Have some friends and people meeting with you and praying with you. Now get with somebody who's got some faith. Don't get some negative person around you. You tell them how bad everything is. Well, you just go ahead and buy your casket because it's over. You get with some people like that. I mean, seriously, go buy yourself a casket, you know, because that's the way some people think. They say, well, it's getting bad. It's going worse. You're going down. It's over. And the fourth thing is, look at an unavoidable stress as an opportunity for growth. Look at it positively and not negatively. I like that article. Now, I'm trying to help you out because 2005, God has told me that dreams are going to come alive in 2005. I personally believe that you're going to get more success than ever before. I mean, when he closes a door, he'll open a door. I've had people come up to me and say, I lost my job. I look at them and say, well... There's a new one opening to you. They were almost, some of them actually thought I was going to say to them, well, it's over for you. You're going down. You're going to fall apart. You know what I mean? I didn't say, I said, you're going to get a better job. You're going to get a better job. Because God closed one door and opened another door. You understand? There's a different way of speaking that. I believe they're going to get a better job, be more successful than ever before. I've had people come up to me and say, Pastor, I'm doing so much in sales, I can't believe it. Matter of fact, I had people calling me on the phone right now, and I, they got my number, and my goodness, it's amazing. I heard about that statement too. That's amazing, that's good, let it happen, don't stop it. Amen? Because somebody will find out about it and write that, get that number away from you sooner or later. But let it happen. Good things are happening to my People, dreams are coming alive in 2005. Everybody say that loud. Dreams are coming alive. Say it again. Dreams. I really believe that God wants you not to live in stress. I believe he's going to bless you with money and what money cannot supply. I believe God is going to do that for you. I believe the church has been uh, unaffected at some time in the past. We need to stop that. We need to get so blessed that we can help somebody else. I had a missionary call me this last week, and he told me, he said, Pastor Kennedy, I, I hate to ask for money, but if I don't get some money, I won't be able to pay my employees. So I said, well, I'll give you some money. Our church will give you some money. And I called another pastor, and I told him about it, and he gave some money. And then I had Eddie Mitchell and I together called four or five other pastors, and we got some more money, and we took care of his problem that he had in a few moments. And I said to these pastors on the phone, I said, if God has been blessing you lately, they said, yes, I'm being blessed. Well, I said, I'm here to take some of that money away from you today. I'm here to help you today. I'm going to have to take some money for this other missionary that we can help him out. We solved that problem in a few moments. In a few moments, his problem solved. And he talked to me on the phone. He said, I'm almost, he said, pastor, I'm actually crying because of what has happened here today. I said, well, God loves you, and we, we're so happy that we can be effective. The church can be effective to help you through this problem and other people. 
You remember I've been talking out of Psalms 91 a lot about being planted in the house of the Lord? Remember that God wants you to have a flourishing tree. That flourishing tree is to bear fruit. Now the fruit stays on the tree, it's useless. You have to take the fruit off and let that fruit, fruit begin to bless other people, bless your family, and bless other people. And then you've got fruit that's really doing something. If you just hold on to it, it might ruin you, hurt you, limit you. God wants to bless you over and over again in your life. I really believe God is calling us to be fruitful and multiply in everything we do in life. God has a purpose for everyone in this room. There's no doubt about it. He has a purpose for you. He loves you. He doesn't want you to live under stress. He wants you to have life and life more abundantly. And in America, you have opportunities. I visit Haiti once in a while, and they have 80% unemployment. They would like to have something to make them successful. They just have 80% unemployment. You have employment in America. God will help you. I believe God really wants to take care of his people. He wants you to be fruitful and multiply. I really believe that, but you've got to use that fruit for the right purposes that God is allowing you to be born in this country, not to become selfish, but become something that can benefit someone else. I like reading Genesis, the 12th chapter, verse 2. Genesis, the 12th chapter, verse 2, when it talks about our spiritual father called Abraham, how he wanted to take that blessing that God gave him. Remember, God gave him the blessing. He was from Iraq, believe it or not. He left there on a journey to find a land filled with milk and honey. And ultimately, he got blessed, and God gave him the promise to him. And that promise is for everyone in this room, because he was your spiritual, spiritual father, Abraham was. Here's what it says in Genesis 12, chapter, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. That was his promise. I will bless you and make your name great. And this is what it says, this last part of this verse. And you shall be a blessing. Now that's just not himself. He's going to bless somebody else. You have to change your self-image. Everyone in this room needs to change their self-image. You've got to think as God thinks about you. God sees you as a person living in victory. God sees you going to heaven and not to the other place. God is on your side. You have to change the way you think about yourself and start confessing what God is saying about you. If you don't do that, I don't believe you'll be really totally blessed. I really mean that. And you'll see something in a few moments in the verses that we study. God's purpose for Abraham was making sure that he understood that he was going to bless him and bless his wife and bless their children. And he was going to bless a nation and bless the world. Everyone in this room has that same kind of blessing that Abraham over him, you have it over your life. God wants you to become a blessing to other people. We read the verses in Proverbs, the 24th chapter, verse 7, where it says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We've got to understand, how do you think about yourself? What do you think about yourself? Do you think you're poor, or you think you're going to get success? You think you're going to make it or you think you're going to fail? You've got to think a certain way inside you. God looks at you and he believes you're successful. God looks at you and says, that person is successful. And all the time I say, God, how can I help my people? He said, you've got to help them change their self-image. I said, well, God, and I said this to the Lord. I said, Lord, you've been working on them a long time and I don't know if you've been successful yet. Because a lot of them have not changed that much. I came from a dysfunctional family, and I understand because they'd walk around the house saying, you're going to be a failure, you're never going to make it, you're going to go down, it's over for you. I heard that as I was growing up. But I began to believe God's word, and the word of God began to tell me that I can overcome anything because, because of the purpose of God that God has for my life. And it began to change the way I think about myself. Come on, somebody. You've got to understand that you are sons and your daughters of Almighty God if you're a Christian this morning. If you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're different than the way you used to be. You have God working for you. And He wants you to make a powerful impact 
impact on this world. He wants your fruit to make an impact. He wants you to become a blessing to other people. Yes to yourself, yes to your family, yes to other people. He really wants to bless you. But we've got to line ourselves up with the Word of God, both spirit and the Word of God inside of us. We've got to line up with it. We've got to think different. We've got to get our mind thinking different. If you do, I promise you'll get the result that you want to get. If you think you're blessed, you're going to get blessed. If you think you're poor, you're going to be poor. If you think you can't, you won't. If you think you can, you will. But you've got to change the way you think. Because God thinks different than you think about yourself. Matter of fact, let's look at a verse in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, verse 8. Now, let me tell you something. This verse, it'll come up on the screen in a moment. I want you to get this deep inside of you. I want you to understand how God thinks about you. God looks at you different than the way you look at yourself. Now, look what it says in Isaiah 55th chapter, verse 8. Watch verse 8. Watch what it says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, there have been too many people in earthly thinking, not heavenly thinking. There have been earth thinking people. He says, for the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Now we understand that God has everything under control. Do we believe that? Well, whether you believe this or not, you have everything under control too. Because of your relationship to Him. It's not self-exaltation that you're trying to glorify yourself. Because of your relationship with God, God gives out a blessing to you and said, bless them. He thinks different than you think. He thinks from heavenly thoughts, not earthly thoughts. His thoughts are different than your thoughts. God really wants you blessed. God really wants you prospering. God really wants you to have everything you need in life and have this fruit in your life that you begin to bless your family and bless other friends and bless the world. That's the way God sees it. God says, I really would like them to have everything if they'll just trust me. God said, I've come to give them life and life more abundantly. But we've got to get rid of this negative thought life that's inside of us and start thinking more of a Faith, positive faith kind of concept inside of us. And get this moving deep inside of our heart. My thoughts are not God's thoughts. I used to think I was going to be a failure. No, God tells me I'm going to be a success. I used to think when I lost a job, I'd never find another one. God says, I'm closing a door as a new door opening up to you. When you were sick, you say, it's through for me. I had people looking at me before when I was real sick and said, buy a casket. Truthfully, they were negative. They were people like Job had with him. People that were confessing negative ideas instead of positive ideas. But I thank God for some of my people looked at me and said, you're going to be a better man. You're going to turn out to be a better man because of what you've gone through. They spoke positively to me. I want you to understand that God is for us. We've got to get rid of these negative, contradicting ideas that are in our mind. Look what it says in Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 18. Look what it says. But those, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. If you let something come out of your mouth, I promise you, it can defile you if it's not based upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God. You've got to be able to say, God is for me. Who can be against me? It doesn't matter what type of negative situation that is facing your life. You can overcome it. I mean, that quick. If you believe that God has everything under His control. 
He goes on to say in verse 19, For out of the heart perceive evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy. Now listen to what it says in verse 20. These are the things which defile a man. Now I actually believe that negative thoughts are seeds to your mind. Positive thoughts are seed to your mind. If you get negative thoughts, you get bitterness in your heart. And it's hard to deal with these bitterness attitudes that begin to dominate people's lives. You got to get into real faith in God and not get these strongholds of bitterness in your mind. Understand if God be for you, who can be against you? God's on your side. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Let's read this together right now, verse 4 and 5. Now here's what it says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into a captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now we've got to remove these offenses, cut them off at the root, arrest them by the word of God. We've got to tell these things, they've got to stop it. If you don't tell them to stop it, They'll dominate you. And if they dominate you, they're holding you back from God's purpose for your life. God has a purpose for every person that is saved. If you're saved, God has a purpose for you. But you've got to be able to deal with these things. Remove these things. Cut them off at the root. Arrest them by the word of God. Understand if God be for you, who can be against you. I like this verse, verse 5. Look at verse 5 there in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see, your thoughts unchallenged can change the course of your life. You have to challenge those thoughts with the Word of God. You have to say, it won't happen, so it's based upon the Word of God. When I was sick, I said, I will be healed. When I went through financial difficulties, I said, it will turn around. Why? I've read the Bible. I'm obedient to the Bible. I challenge those thoughts. Those tests with the Bible. The Bible's been around longer than you've been around. You challenge it. You say, no way. Do you know who I am? I'm a son of Almighty God. You've got to be able to say, I'm a daughter of Almighty God. God is my father. Abraham was my spiritual father. And he lived by faith in his God who gave him a promise. See, it's not carnality. You say, God is blessing me. Not I am blessing myself. God is blessing me. God is the one giving me the fruits. God is the one that's opening doors. God is the one that's taking me to a better place than I've ever been before. Now it talks about that we must deal with certain things, these strongholds, these arguments, these high things these thoughts, and we must deal with them. That word thought, what that means, bring in wrong thoughts into captive obedience by the Christ himself. You say, I believe the word of God. You gotta change the channel. You gotta pull the weeds out. You gotta be able to say to yourself, I'm under the Spirit's control and the word of God's control. I can deal with it. Keep your mind sharp and focus upon the word of God. You got to do it. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verse 12, tells us this. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul and spirit and the joint and marrow, and is, listen to this, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intention of the heart. God's saying, listen to me, I'm trying to challenge that thought. That is different than my thought about you. 
God said, I see you as blessed. I see you as one that can bless other people. I see you as a person that's been called to be a blessing to the whole world. Abraham or Coral or Eric. Any of you. God said, I want to make you a prosperous person. But we have to challenge these thoughts. High things. Another thing he said in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. High things. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, it began to lie to you. High things. Let me show you something. You think about another man or another woman. High things. That's against the word of God. You got to be able to say, shut up. I'm married. That's against the word of God. High things that begin to control you, become bright things in your mind. And you see them in your mind and you begin to think about them and the bright things in your mind. And you, whew, I see it, I hear. You lay at house, you lay at your house on the couch and you're thinking these bright things, these high things. You better control those things or those things will control you if you don't control those things. You either control them or they control you. And if you let those high things dominate you, you'll do something that hurts yourself. It's got to be obedient to Christ in every way. It's self-exhortation. It's pride. Trying to lift yourself up higher and higher. But you're not lifting yourself up higher and higher when you're submitted to God. God blessing me. It's to his glory. But you may have a lots of money. He gives it to you. You're not getting into pride. That's called humility. You're submitted yourself to God. What does it say in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 12? Look up on the screens. And whoever exalts himself will be what? Humbled. And he who humbles himself will be what? So as soon as you're submitted to God, you're saying, God, you gave me a promise in your Bible and by your spirit. And you say, I'm submitted to you with all my heart. That's humility. That's not pride. And then you'll be what? Exalted. Now, if you walk around in sex or, you know, self-exhortation, you say, I did it, I did it, I did it. Then you can be filled with pride. But when you say, God did it, God is blessing me. God has given me a word, a prophetic word, a word of God for the word of God. That's humility. I'm submitting myself to God. And he's doing it. He's in charge. Hallelujah. Don't let anything control you, but let God control you. Did you hear me? Don't let anything control you, but let God control you. Get this deep inside you. Get real. Let God control you, and he'll make you a millionaire. And make sure that, that you get that millions of dollars. You don't just keep it on the tree. It can run you. You've got to share it with other people, your family and other people. Sow it and you what? Reap it. Sow it and you what? First Peter tells us in the first chapter, verse 13, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, set your mind on Christ. Gather all your thoughts together. Be sober, that's clear, with singleness of mind. And rest your hope fully. Now look at this fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Understand, he did it all. Do you believe that? He did it all. You mean, I will get blessed because of my submission to God? Yes. You will get blessed. Stay submitted to God. Then you've got to deal with these things, these arguments. That's another passage in that, in that passage of Scripture in 2 Chronicles, Corinthians, the 10th chapter. It talks about arguments. That's, you've got to cast these arguments down, these high things that argue with God. Do you know anybody has got the ability or the knowledge to argue with God? 
argue with God? Nobody can fulfill that, that job description except God. You don't argue with God. You say, there it is. It's a fact. And you line yourself up with it. You quit arguing with God. You can go all the way through, through 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, verses 3 to 4. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome word, it tells them that they're actually lying to themselves. God doesn't want us to enter into an argument with Him. He wants us to come to a place of obedience to Him. Hear me, not arguing with Him, but obedience to Him. And the moment you become obedient to Him, God begins to bless you. And it's from Him. You're humble. Yes, Lord, thank you for making me a man that owns that business. Thank you for bringing me that self. Thank you for opening a, a greater opportunity to me. Thank you. It's him doing it for you. And you're very humble in submitting to God's plan for your life. It's powerful when you understand this. Don't ever start arguing with God. I'm mad at you, God. Don't you dare do that. When I had my problems in the past, I didn't sit around and say, God, I'm mad at you because I had a stroke and I can't speak. I said, God, your word said, by your stripes, I am healed. And I hung into her. I said, I know that you're real. I know you can touch me. And he did. When I went through financial difficulties, tough financial difficulties, I said, God, they're around me, but I believe in you. And he brought me out of it. You see, his word is true, but you can argue with him. I'm upset, God. I, I'm sick and I'm mad. You remember years ago when I had a problem with my health, and I said, God, why did you do this to me? And God said, no, this to me, son. Don't argue with me. He said, if you die, you're going to tell me you were upset with me when you get to heaven? And if you're going to get help, you're going to need me on planet Earth. Don't get upset with me. I am God. I, I am God. Okay. Don't argue with me. Submit to me. Whether on earth or in heaven, submit. I am what? God. I like what 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 23 says. That's what it says here. Don't ever, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that that produce quarrels. Don't ever quarrel with God. He's bigger than we are, but he loves us so much that he gave his son. Always agree with the word of God. Always agree with the spirit of God. Understand that if God be for you, who can be against you? It's powerful. I read Romans the 13th chapter a lot when I'm discussing this type of subject. When it talks about in the 13th chapter, verse 1 through 4, when it says, let every soul be subject to the governing authority. For there is no, here's a big one, there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Wow. He was telling me, he says, son, I know how to be your God. Trust me and you'll fulfill the purpose that you are called to fulfill on earth if you submit to me with all your heart. The fourth thing we're gonna deal with right now is strongholds. Now I really believe these strongholds sometimes because they got walls, they got security, and a lot of people wanna agree with them all the time. They have certain beliefs that they hang on to. They say, I believe this. And I really believe they become longer weeds in our life. And if it gets so big, they control us, and we better bring this under control of being under obedience to Christ Jesus. 
Here's what it says in Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2. Let's read it very carefully. Ready? Because I'm about to close. It says, do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world. Change. That's earthly thinking, not heavenly thinking. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change your self-image. You're submitted to God. God says, bless Abraham or bless Eric. Let them have it. Because they're dependent upon me. Give it to them. Bless Lawrence Kennedy. I'm ready. Give it to him. I'm getting revelation on this. By renewing of your mind that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect will. God saying, I will take care of you. Trust me. Tim, when you lost your job, no one ever believed that you'd begin to take care of finance at the North Church, would they? Lost a job, couldn't get a job, all sorts. Too well trained. Too well trained. And all of a sudden now he's upstairs working in finances at my church. Who would ever believe that would happen? Did you think that would happen? Never thought that would happen. Amazing, isn't it? How God closes one and opens a better one. Mike Kislek was the center on the Cowboys. Close one door, and now Mike's going to become extremely wealthy in another area. You see? Close one, open another one. Now, you can get despair over it. I lost my job. It's over for me. I just won't get me a gun. I'm through now. Hallelujah. No, no. His thought is not your thoughts. His ways is not your ways. It's like heaven and earth. You've been dwelling upon the earth too long and thinking earthly thoughts. When God says, don't you understand? I have everything under my control. Submit to me. Just submit to me. That's all you got to do. Yes, Lord. I set my mind on things above and not just upon this world. And God says, I'll give you what you want. Not that you won't have trials in it, Ken but I'm heading you toward that end. You'll get there. It doesn't say anything. You can have a tough time, but God tests you. That's what the Bible says. Test you and then approve you to bring you to his purpose that you know it's him, his nature. He's the one that helped me meet the right people, open the right door and make things happen for my success. Brooks, is that true? He's the one. And you wake up and you realize, you mean that God was all the time telling me, just like he did Abraham, I will make you a blessing. But trust me, I'll close it, I'll open it. Listen to me. That's the way our life will always be. But you got to become in a sense of positive faith in God. That God has everything under control. You hear me? Don't you be negative. Be positive. Let's stand up, everybody. I looked in the paper at Dallas Morning News about the Pope, John Paul II, died. It says he served the poor, helped vanquish communism. I read about that. He was a good, very good Pope for the Catholic Church. I read that. But he went through some tough times, ultimately get to the position of leading that church. It's amazing to think about.
Come on, everybody, get this deep inside you right now. How many have been through stress lately? Come on, lift your hands up high. I mean, we're going to stop it. Number one, let's do some things right. Number one, go in there and talk to Tom Thompson in the workout room. It's free right now, ain't it, Tom? Tom has his Ph.D. in leadership, Master in Kinesiology from North Texas University, Ph.D. from Regents University in Virginia. He's a professor. has four workout rooms, and he does it here at the church. It's free to help people out. That's four of them. You know why? One way you deal with stress is walk a little bit. I love you folks. Take a walk at night. Take a walk in the morning. Talk to Tom. He'll say, here's how you deal with it. Come on. We want to help you not to fall apart. Then you pray and meditate. Get the Word of God. Get those little, little cards and put it, in the, put it in your pocket. It says, you can overcome anything. Just trust in me. And different verses like that. And keep it in your mind. Meditate. Roll it over in your mind. And pray every day. You don't have to pray with me on Sunday morning. You don't have to pray with me on Monday through Friday or Saturday. But I say you need to pray at night. You need to pray in the morning. Pray at night. And you need to stay in the Word of God. All the time. If you don't, you're adding pressure to yourself. Number three, get somebody else that can help you out. If you don't know how to deal with the situation, get somebody that's in banking. If you're in a financial situation and you don't know how to deal with it, Get somebody that's got expertise in banking to help you get out of that problem. They're in this church. And if you're having a psychological problem, don't know how to deal with it, you can talk to Eric Wood. He's a PhD in psychology. He's one of my sons in the faith. He thinks he's smarter than me, but he's not. You understand that, Eric? You got to understand. Now, Eric, how old are you? 27. I was 27 one time. But I'm 57. But you've never been 57. There's a whole lot of things. I've been 27. But I've got a little older. Get with some people who can help you. But he can help you. The church has this for you. You get your workout clothes. Go down there and talk to Tom. Go in there and work out. Don't even have to pay for it. Just go in there and work out. Get some training. Pray. I'll pray with you. Need counseling? I got somebody to counsel with you. Get in a small group ministry. Have some friends that are talking positive statement to you, helping you out. You deal with stress. With stress, you don't have to put up with it. And understand that stress comes for a reason. It's to make you better, not to hurt you. You lose your job. How many people in here lost their job in the past? Look around for a moment. Wave your hand at me. You've lost your job. See? There's a lot of people who've lost their job. But God ultimately helped them find a better job. How many have gone through a divorce in the past? Come on. It hurt, didn't it? But God's got something better for you if you trust Him for it. And you might have to find somebody who can help you get through that problem. Say, listen, this is how you dealt with it. How I dealt with it. Come on, everybody. We don't have to put up with these things. But if we keep not dealing with them, I promise you, they'll control you instead of you controlling them. And if they control you, they will hurt you. It will destroy you. Amen. All the people that have been through stress, put both hands up right now, please. Let's all pray right now and ask God to deliver us from this and start doing some things right and understand that money's on its way. Everybody say, money's on its way. I'm going to be successful. Money's on its way. God's going to bless me so I can bless myself, my family, and other people. God is going to bless me. I'm humble before God. God's going to do it. Not just myself. God is going to do it because I'm submitted to God. Now give him praise. Everybody in this room, just give him praise. Come on!
I want you to take control of your negative thoughts as dominating you because they're not from God. Take control of it. How do I do it? Change the channel. Change the channel. Flip it to another channel. Read a book. Get somebody who's got faith to lay their hand on your head and pray for you. Submit yourself to God and His Word. Guard your thoughts. Amen. How many can say amen? amen? I want you to live peaceable with God, not arguing with God. Live at peace with God, not living in arguments. Live in peace. It's there for you. Hallelujah. Sing that song. Come on, everybody. Your blood. Speaks a better word. Come on. All the earthly claims on, I've heard upon the earth speaks righteousness for me. Stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your cross testifies in grace. Tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach our earthly confidence. It's only by your blood. Yeah. What can wash away our sins? What can Take your neighbor by the hand. We're going to close in just a moment. Now, when you leave today, you leave victorious. I understand you live victorious in your life. We're God sensitive, not just, and I'm not cutting down any ch church that has this other statement, I'm not seeker sensitive. We're God sensitive. Our church is God sensitive. If you're close to God, then everything will begin to work in a proper way. Stay close to God. I can depend upon a friend here, but my friend can't help me like God can. My friend can be encouragement, help me, but they can't solve problems that God can solve any problem. I want you to pray for your neighbor right now. I always do it this way because I believe you can pray for your neighbor many times more than you can pray for yourself. Would you just ask God to really bless them? Just close your eyes and ask God to bless that person you're holding their hands with. Father, let your people be blessed. Let them all understand how much you care about them. Thank you, Father. Let them stay humble before you. 
And then, God, would you bless them with everything they need in life? Let the blessing flow to them, through them, to bless their self, bless their family, and bless the world. Do it, God, because you're for them. Please do it. Jesus, do it. Hallelujah. If you believe God answered your prayer, give him a great big applause. Hallelujah. I say it. Hallelujah. All right. How many visitors do I have here today? Visitors, slip your hand up high. Let me look at all the visitors. Would you do me a favor? Pick your purse up. Pick up your coat. Come down to the front. Let me pray one prayer for you before you leave. It's probably the best thing I can do for you. Just pray, and then I'll dismiss you. Just come down to the front. Don't be afraid. Come on, church. Give them a great big hand. Come close. You know, funny thing about this, you got up and got to church on time today. That's pretty good, guys. That's pretty good because a lot of people got up late and said, well, I'll go next Sunday. But that's the way it works. And I'm glad you're here today. And we're going to pray for you. And I can't get everybody's name. But after the service today, you'll be able to follow this gentleman right over here. we more. And he'll lead you to a room. we got some refreshments in there. I have some drinks and some eating things for you. And then I'll come in and shake hands with all of you and get to meet you for a moment. If you want to, I'd like for you to. I want the church that's here today. Would you lift your hands toward these wonderful folks? And would you bless them? I really believe in blessing. Would you pray for them right now? Bless them. Come on, let's pray. Father, Lord, these people that are with us today, the best thing I can do for them is pray for them today and the rest this week. And God, I pray that you would just let them understand that you're for them, not against them. That you're going to help them to make the right decisions, to move forward to better days than they've ever been before. I don't care how wealthy and how successful they are at this moment. You got a better lifestyle, a better high lifestyle than they ever had before. Lord, you came to give us life and life more abundantly. Let them understand the abundant life that you have for them. I pray it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Now, if you'll turn to your right and you'll follow him out. Come on, give him a hand as they go, everybody. Come on, church. Remember tonight, I believe it's at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, Cindy Jacobs will be with us. She's known as a great prophetess of the Lord. She'll be with us tonight. We'll have a great time tonight with her. And then we'll move to better days. Remember, John Maxwell's coming. Salvador's coming in the month of April. We've got some good things happening. And go tell somebody about Jesus. Bring them down to the Lord. Let's change everybody's mind. What do you mean? Help them realize that God really wants to take care of them and bless them. Amen? Do you believe that? On three, praise the Lord. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. When we were going through the deepest fire, he said, sow a seed and direct it toward that storm because your seed is bigger than than your storm or your mountain. How many of you believe that tonight? And so tonight, before we pray together, Dr. Kennedy said he wanted to receive an offering for our ministry. May I submit to you that the soil you'll sow this seed into is going to take this prayer ministry as far as Jerusalem. And the bottom line on that is there's going to be a special blessing on what we're doing there because we've been praying for it for 21 years. I want you to focus your seed in anticipation of this prayer on whatever the problem is that is confronting your life. Whatever the problem is, whether it's emotional, physical, spiritual, and believe me when I say to you tonight, the problem 
has been designed by God to press you into this anointing. You sow a seed toward that problem, and I declare to you tonight, your seed is bigger than your storm. If you believe that tonight, I want you to say a good praise the Lord. Now let's just say my seed's bigger than my mountain. Dr. Kennedy, you come on, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll come back and pray right after you receive our offering. Amen. You believe that? You know, the reason I know this is true, everything he's saying that he's gone through, and, you know, some places they might not receive it as much as I receive it. I want the ushers to come and begin to pass out an envelope, and we're going to give a great offering tonight, I have no doubt. Do you want your seed to conquer your storm? Sow a big seed, bigger storm, bigger seed. Don't be a little seed, big seed. Can I hear an amen? We'll talk to you in a minute about it when you get these envelopes in your hand. Two months before, God had always visited me about Larry, and this is why our relationship developed. Years and years gone by, I called him when I had a vision. I said, Larry, you're supposed to come and help me. We're going to be friends. It's the first conversation we ever had. He was youth pastor at Beverly Hills. And he said, really? Who are you? I said, God spoke to me. I said, you're supposed to do this. Well, we began to be dear friends. Years passed. And God showed me a series of dreams and visions and things that would happen. I even saw Rockwall Church built before it was built. I told him that in a dream that some men were going to call him into a room and set a chair down. And they're going to offer you a church. And you're to refuse it. Because you would be hired instead of being the man of God. And that not within a few weeks, they actually did this to him. And he said, I don't play cards. You heard that famous story? It actually happened to him, literally. Then I saw Rockwell Church before it was built. And I saw the carpet, uh, the color of the carpet. And, said it was, and I saw it. And I told Larry, you're going to build a great church. Saw it. Saw him speaking in auditoriums and coliseums. Saw it. Said, don't be worried about it. You're going to do it. This is before these things happen. You don't say you're a prophet until these things happen. The last time God spoke to me to about Larry Lee, and all these things are verified in our history, two months before anything happened to Larry, I called Larry and I said, Larry, I'm very troubled. I don't want to tell you about what God told me. He said, what did God tell you? And I said, Larry, I had this vision. Melvin and I and Coral and yourself and me, we were walking down the sidewalk, Melvin and the girls, the girls were up in front of us. You and I were back here, and I saw this dark figure coming at us. You remember this? This dark figure, and I think it was a big demon. And it was coming at us, and I'm a real protective type of personality. And I said I kept my eyes on this figure at least to hurt the girls because I would have went and tried to do harm. Really, I would have. It's my nature. And I would have went, and I watched, and I told Larry this dream. It was a vision dream because God visits me in dreams at night, wakes me up. They're real, and I know it. I said, all of a sudden, I looked, he passed the girls, and he was behind me all of a sudden, and Larry was gone. And Larry walked through a gate and went up on steps and went into a house, and this figure of a man followed him into the house. And the door got locked, and I stood out on the sidewalk, and I described the house, and they had just bought the house. I didn't know it. They had just bought that house. And I said, Larry, I stood on the sidewalk, and... Um, I said, God, I gotta go help my friend. So I ran up to the door and I tried to open the door and I couldn't get in, I was locked out. I was literally locked out. You remember this? I said, I couldn't get in, Larry. So I stood out on the sidewalk again and I ran across the street and there was a lady, a blonde headed lady sitting in a rocking chair rocking. She had all these little people running around telling them things to do. Remember this two months, two months before anything happened. I said, Larry, I'm very disturbed. Because I, I said, my friend, he's, being, he's in a fight for his life. And I'm locked out of that house. I can't get in. She says, so? There was no big attitude. Didn't care. Indifference. I said, call 911. Get some help out here to help me. I stood on the sidewalk again. I ran to the door and I grabbed the door and I tried to pull the door. The window, sh uh, window and, and God spoke to me. This one you're going to be locked out of. And I heard Larry inside the house, and I told him this two months before it happened. I heard him, and this, whatever it was, banging against walls and slamming against walls. And I knew that this battle, and I told him, I said, Larry, no one is going to be able to help you 
is going to be the fight for your sanity, the fight for your life, the fight for your very existence. And I'm sorry, my friend, I'm locked out. I'm locked out. And I won't be able to do nothing. Didn't he? And when that happened, Larry called me that day and he says, man, it happened today. The battle is about to start. It was two or three weeks or four weeks before the public knew about it. And the betrayal of Mrs. Sawyer and the media. It was secret. We didn't say much to anybody. We kept it all because we didn't want to disturb the body of Christ that we were going to be an onslaught of attack. But remember the Holy Ghost told me and I told my friend, this is coming. And no one, not me, I couldn't get in to help you. No one is going to be able to help you. So when he's standing here tonight, the Holy Spirit reminded me of that. He said, son, I told you that it was my will I sent him into. Right. Two months before it happened, I saw it and told him. And Larry, there's nothing you can do about it right. and nothing I can do about it. It's going to happen. And oh my God, it happened. And then one day, years later now, all sorts of hell have broke loose. Larry flew in. He was in the hotel and we talked and he told me, I said, Larry, I think you should pastor again. I believe that's the start of your ministry. I want you to hear this. This is how God leads. There's the reason I'm saying this. God, God took him into the wilderness. Remember Jesus was led in Matthew 4 into the wilderness to be tempted? Don't think that was the devil. That was God took him there and he had to stand before devil himself and fight him. Do you understand this? Now I understood it finally sitting in that chair. What God showed me. You're going to be locked out. And I was locked out by circumstances. Because my instinct is always to nurture and protect. That's my instinct. I can't help it. It's, it overwhelms me. It's the way I am. Sitting in my house one day, the phone rang, and Larry called, and he said, well, I'm going to take a church. And I said, yeah, you are. And he says, guess where? And I said, you're going to take Jerry Bernard's church. He said, what? I said, in San Diego, California. You're going to pastor that church in San Diego, California. He says, Lawrence, how do you know? I didn't know. I said, so I'm sitting here watching Jerry Bernard on television and God spoke to me before the phone rang. You were going to pastor his church. You're to accept it. And he had already accepted it. But you're to accept it. It's the will of God. And I said, Larry? And he said, well, he was humble at that time, very broken and hurt. I said, Larry, God spoke to me again. He said, Larry's going to have 3,000. It's going to be very rapid. Larry said to me, he says, well, maybe in a few years. You don't know my circumstance out here. I said, no, it's going to happen. God spoke it to me. God spoke it to me. And hear the word of the Lord. A man had never missed on you. All of this has been to prepare you to be able to stand against mighty demons. Demons that terrorize places and terrorize continents and terrorize people. Hear the word of the Lord. That's why all this has happened to you. And you're going to be able to fight the spirits of the air and bring them down over Israel in a holy war. You hear the word of the Lord. I've never missed on this, Larry, with you. I'm not missing now. You will defeat mighty demons. You used to talk about them when you said, God, I want to be able to do it. And God now has prepared you. <laughs> you know what I mean? You used to preach about it, but now it's happening and it's happened. And something inside you knows you can do it. And it's sure not in your natural grace. It's in the high great power of God. You hear the word of the Lord. I don't have to scream it in King James English. God told me that sitting there. Who? You hear the word of the Lord. There's a revival coming. Hear the word of the Lord. There's a move of God coming. Hear the word of the Lord. 
You must bow your knees and cry to God. Hear the word of the Lord. And you must pray change. Hear the word of the Lord. You've been apathetic and indifferent going through the motion and playing church. Hear the word of the Lord. He's calling you to the prayer closet again. And he's going to birth forth his body with great labor pains and see the move of God take place. Hear the word of the Lord and yield to it. God says, here. It's here. It's here. God told me one thing else years ago. And this is another word of the Lord. Why God told me these last two things I had to do. He said, you got to do these two things, Lawrence. It wasn't politically good for me. But I'm not a politician. Never been known to be one. I'm obeying God. He said, number one, you got to honor your friend in your church. And number two, you got to honor your friend for this movement. I've done that. You understand? And something is breaking tonight more than you realize. In a spirit realm that is far beyond anything you understand constantly in your mind. John Miller, stand up. Lift your hands. Prophesy to the people. We're working on you all night. because they had buried him in a tomb. I watched for three days and my power exploded over the powers of darkness and my power shall prevail in this world, saith the Lord. For out of despair, out of heartache, out of failure, when my people shall bow before me, when they shall acknowledge their faults before me, when they shall acknowledge their faults before one another, I shall pour out mercy for I am a God of mercy. I do not delight in pouring out judgment on my people, but I delight in mercy. And I will shower you, says the Lord. I will cause the glory to fall over you. I will humble you first. I will judge you first. I will purify your hearts. So when you are pure, you will handle my glory. You will handle my glory and not take the pride unto yourself. You will not acknowledge that I have done this or my hands have done this. But you will point people to me. For there is a visitation coming upon this earth that will shake the planet. There is a visitation, as it were, that will throw the earth off its axis. It shall be my glory that falls on humble men and women. Men and women who have buried themselves in the prayer closet. Men and women who have allowed themselves to sink into the shadows, I shall pour out my spirit on them, and I shall push back the darkness, says the Lord. For you have not been unable in your own strength and ability. You have not been able in your own cunning to destroy the works of darkness or to push it back. But I will flow through you. For it is not by your might nor by your power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. And I am, I am, I am beginning. There is a cloud that's forming over the face of the earth. It is not a cloud of darkness, but it is a cloud of my glory and a yes. cloud of my spirit. Yes. My spirit shall begin simultaneously to be poured out all over the face of the planet. I will look for humble men. I will look for humble women. I will look for those who have hidden themselves in my presence. And I shall flow through them and I shall thwart the works of darkness, says the Lord. Now I personally, I personally want this offering to be very generous, but I also want it to be a statement of our endorsement of our brother and what he is called to do. Years ago, God said to me, the reason I moved to Dallas, this one little phrase came to me, he's not going to be able to do what he has to do unless you go. And I told him that. It was the word of the Lord. You can't do what he's supposed to do unless you help him. We're going to help him tonight. And we're going to let it be spread far and wide. Larry and I are in love. 
Do you hear anybody say anything else? They're mentally ill or full of demons. All right? I want the ushers to come forward, and I want you to receive this offering, and I want you to bless my friend. Now, let me say this to you. We're going to see the greatest move of God. All my ministry, God has spoke to me that this would happen, that I would lead a fellowship of brothers. Larry passed a baton to me. My whole heart is to see a bunch of brothers get together and do something bigger than they can do by themselves. That's my heart. And we're going to do a good job at this. But let's have a good offering here. And this prayer anointing is going to come on us. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to lift. Something in the spirit world. Many of you are back to COTR that haven't been around COTR in years. The McGee's here. There's others. Some reason God's calling people back. They feel it. Well, it's a time. I haven't been able to release to prophesy to that man in years because I was locked out. Just a few months ago, he started saying, invite him now, honor him now. I'm, not, I'm just that way. I obey God. And I've been wanting to do other things, but you can't. You've got to let God do. How many believe it's the best thing to do is let God be God? Because when he's finished to work on somebody and finished doing something in you, and when it's all finished, then it's finished. You got that offering? As soon as you get it, I'm not going to hurry it. Larry's going to go out to TBN after he leaves here, and they're going to be on hosting him out there, so he won't be able to fellowship with us. Maybe he can come and see us in Gatlinburg, Tennessee at our next gathering, but we'll get together some more. But um, I want us all stand now. How hungry are you? Slip your hands up high as Larry begins to pray for you and lead you in this prayer anointing. Lift our voice. Let's lift our voice. Let's tell him that we love him tonight. Let's tell him we love him more than we love our things. More than we love our name. We love your name, Lord. More than we love our church. More than we love our families. More than we love anything, Lord. All you asked Peter was, do you love me? And so, Lord, we say, yes, Lord, we love you. We put you first. We choose you. And we magnify you. Now, if you have a prayer language, I want you for 30 seconds to pray in tongues. And prepare your heart now. Prepare your heart now. Stir up yourself in the Spirit. Holy Matala Matuli Belezi Tamburamaka Samba, Bonamana Mundi de Mabarati told Lede Mabakasa. Holy Manda Bobari de Deva, Bobada, Borobada, Dodi, the Anda, the Bolo, the Bushudu, the Babala, the Kusu, the Babala, the Babala, the Kusu, the Babala, 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 we're going to take this so deep tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Now, don't break the flow of the Holy Spirit. Keep those hands up for just a moment, but look up at me for just a moment. Tonight, I want to lead you in a corporate prayer, but I want you to pray it as though you and I were in the prayer room all by ourselves, like it's just me and you. I have a strong sense in my heart that God is going to pour out in this prayer tonight, not just a prayer anointing, but there are going to be many of you that will leave this place, and because of this anointing, you're about to go into a double portion of the blessing and the authority of God. I don't understand that exactly. Some of you have been hearing increase and restoration. Some of you have been hearing that God's about to do a brand new thing in your life and in your ministry. How many say, Pastor, God has been speaking that to my heart? This is the foundation for it. And so I want you to pray as though it's just me and you. We're going to lock into this agreement and we're going to believe God. There are three parts to the prayer, our past, our present, and our future. 
And as we pray through each part, I want you to open your spirit wide. I want you to join me and let's make a little cup out of our hands together now. And I want you to pray it with the depth of the Holy Spirit in your heart directly to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. I want you to say out loud, Heavenly Father, I release my bad past to the blood of Jesus Christ and to the power of the Holy Spirit to now work it together for my good. I release my good past with great thanksgiving for all that you have done. But I will not live back there. The past is gone. And I believe now you will do a new thing. I say today, I will seek the face of my God. I will seek your face, O oh Lord, with my heart until I find you. Day by day, I make that commitment anew and afresh. And whatever you tell me, whatever you say in my spirit, I will obey you. I don't belong to the devil or to my ministry or to myself. I belong to Jesus. And whatever you say, I will do without fear. I repent of my fear and I put my fear away and I resist it now. And I declare the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Greater is He who lives now in me than any power or any demon or any emotion or any circumstance. And I declare tonight I will receive a new prayer anointing. I receive it now. I ask you, Father, possess me with the Spirit of Jesus. Now, Heavenly Father, take over my life. Use my life. Pray through me, Lord. Use my mouth, O oh God. Use my body, O oh God. For I present it now to you. I ask for this anointing. And by faith, I take it now. Deep in my spirit, I receive it now. And it is mine. In Jesus' name, I thank you for it, Lord. Now, I want all of you that receive that by faith to lift up your hands and release your life unto the Lord with the lifting up of your hands and go ahead one more time and release your prayer language. Go ahead and open up your mouth right now and begin to allow that anointing to go deep into your spirit right now. Go deep into every man. Go deep into every woman. For I loose it in this house tonight. I loose it in your spirit tonight. I loose it in your mind right now. I loose it in your body right now. Let your prayer language go now. You're going to find acceleration. Give me a little bit more here. You're going to find acceleration. You're going to find divine, a little bit more, divine acceleration by the Holy Ghost. That's it. Thank you. Let it go right now. Let it go right now. The anointing is loosed in this place tonight. Open up on Ode the Bobo Badaviti, Ode the Badaviti to Baba Rama, Asanda, Osa Tibido, Ode Badambo Babari to Baba, Hava Tuta, 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 Don't be a spectator. Jump in the river, brother. Jump in the river. Because it's flowing now like a mighty river. It's like a mighty river. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now reach across these aisles. Everybody move toward the middle. Don't mind the camera. Don't worry about the camera. Reach across the aisles and grab somebody by the hand. You know what we're going to agree? 
Look up here at me right now. Everybody move this way. We're going to agree tonight. And this is what we're going to agree on. You will never have less of this anointing in your life. You will always have more of it. Now, come on, everybody. How many of y'all agree tonight that it's God's will that you never have less than what you have right now, that you only have more and more and more? I want you to agree now. I did not design this night. According to my schedule, I was supposed to be here, and all I want to do is love people and hug you and love you. And I got a call at 4 o'clock this afternoon, and somebody on my staff booked me on the Praise the Lord TBN program tonight to go there and preach at 10.15. It is now 15 minutes till 10, and I am late. Hallelujah. But I'm not going to leave here till I know that you got what you came for. How many of you sense just by the nodding of your head, something's moving in your spirit right now? Something's moving on the inside of you. And now we're going to agree together that what's moving in you, you will never have less of it. Are you with me on that? That you'll always have more, David, always more in your life. I wish I could go around the room and just call names, always more. And I want you to pray, now listen to this, I want you to pray for the person you're touching in agreement. And this is the way we're gonna pray. I want you to pray like their life depends on it because there are several people that I preach to tonight in this room whose life literally depends on it. Lawrence, what you saw, I fought that spirit and he was an assassin. And the media were just a pe just a pawns. They were controlled by a demon that I saw and I dealt with. And I fought him day and night until in the name of Jesus I defeated him. I am here to say to all of you tonight, it does not matter how big and how bad the devil says he is. He will always do two things. Number one, he will always fight. Number two, he will always lose. You can go ahead and clap your hands. He will fight, but he will lose. them by the hand. Say out loud, the devil will fight, but the devil will lose. Now there's somebody in a fight for their life in this room tonight, and that prayer anointing is loose right now. God promised me everywhere I preach this message, it'd fall like a mantle on the people that were listening, and everybody wanted it could just reach up and take it, and you've taken it now, but let's agree now that you'll never have less of it. You'll always have more of it. It'll increase in your life. It'll rise up like a mighty river in your life. It'll possess your life and it will press you into your destiny. I want you to pray for those you're touching right now on the left hand and on the right. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Yemen amo do batata, ando da da ba ba ba. Oh, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, after you agree with them, lift up your voice and start singing to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Lift up your voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Hallelujah. 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 Church, let's
Let's have a victory shout. Somebody in this place, help. I really believe everybody here needs to give God a great big hand. Come on. Come on. deeper kingdom business than you've ever could realize. You were in a meeting in history of the spirit. Now, I'm telling you now, because I know what I'm talking about. I might not know a lot of things, but I know the Holy Ghost. I know the Holy Spirit. You're in a meeting tonight that is more significant than you've ever dreamed you'd ever be in in your life. I'm talking about the ripple effects that's going to affect across this land, around this world. Thus saith the Lord. I was talking to a young man. Come here, young man. You're right there on the end. One day I prophesied over Maranatha. Come here. I kept looking at his face the other day. Pastors, where are you pastor now? Naples, Florida. It's Craig. How do you pronounce your last name, Craig? Craig reminded me today, and I didn't know it, Cor. Here's one of the guys that prophetically many, many years ago I ministered him in Maranatha ministry. Night Pastor's Church on the Rock, Naples, Florida. You know, we're a big family. There's a guy that, Bob Weiner, he used to hold me up. This is the truth, isn't it? You were in some of those meetings. Were you over there? Yeah. They'd hold yeah, me up with both arms. They'd get me under arms like this. This is the truth. And Bob Weiner, and they say, just put your hand on him and prophesy. When I prophesy over five, six, seven, eight hundred of them too. And they just line them up and roll them in front of me. Yea, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt be a pastor. Yea, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt go back to the Philippines. Yea, thus saith the Lord. And they would literally be so exhausted, they would prop us up and hold us. This encouraged me tonight when I saw him and he told me that story. And my wife said to me, honey, I believe you need to believe God. Thank you. And I'm going to say this based on that. Believe God that tomorrow night the prophetic will hit you and you will prophesy over everybody at once a word of the Lord. Because it's got to be the real prophetic thing. I'm not that show you show business. But when the real thing comes, believe me, it's the real thing. We're going to believe God for prophetic anointing tomorrow night to fall on our church and on our Church on the Rock International. Tremendous prophetic anointing to come. I feel a release in the prophetic reason I'm talking this way. I could just get prophesying now over a bunch of you, but we better... Ooh, it's here now. I want to say thank you to the board of directors. A lot of them had to go out back to their churches not to be back in tomorrow, but the board of directors, I love them. These guys, let me tell you something. Sonny Knatzer is one great man of God, folks. I really mean it. And you heard Eddie Mitchell, the little Marine. That's who we got there. One, the little Marine. That's what he is. Don't mess with him. He's a lot tougher than he looks. He's got nine wounds in his body, I believe, or more, to prove that he's a real Marine. a real Marine for God. Tomorrow night we're going to pray to nations. Tomorrow I'm going to take my time for the pastors and I'm going to have different missionaries. Sheriff, Bob, you get me that little bell. It's going to be like the great trumpet. When that bell goes off, missionaries have to stop. So you better have it power packed. Because a lot of guys want to talk. We're going to let a lot of talk. And if you think I'm rude, no, I'm not rude if I tell you you have so much time and you take more time than is allotted to you. You're rude by taking more time than is allotted to you. Don't think I'm rude. Don't tell anybody I'm rude. If I tell you 10, 15 minutes and you go 50, 20 minutes and I say, stop, you say, well, he was rude to me. No, I'm not rude. You're rude because it's my time that I'm giving to you.